Once again, hello everyone and thank you for joining us today. My name is Courtney Lindy and I am the Digital Marketing Manager here at Alchemy. Um, I welcome you to today's webinar, Abuse Deterrent Category 1 Testing, Syringeability Studies. Today's session will be recorded and made available to you in the coming days. If anyone has any questions along the way, please feel free to type them into the Q&A section of your toolbar, and we will be sure to answer those questions at the end. At this time, I'm going to turn the floor over to Angela Moore to begin today's presentation. Thank you, Courtney. Hi, my name is Angela Moore. I'm a scientist here at Alchemy in the Analytical Development Department, and I perform the Category 1 testing along with designing studies for Category 1 testing of abuse deterrent products. So today we're going to talk about abuse deterrent Category 1 testing, in, and um, we're going to specifically focus on syringeability studies. So today, how the webinar will proceed is we are going to talk about the opioid epidemic. We'll move into an overview of abuse deterrent testing for those not familiar with the FDA regulatory guidance. We'll talk about the importance of syringeability abuse deterrent studies through a case study with APANA. And then we will talk about the design of syringeability studies for abuse deterrent formulation. So the opioid epidemic is a public health crisis right now, and it is definitely why we are, why drug companies are developing abuse deterrent formulation. In 2015, over 12 and a half million people misused prescription opioids, and of that, 2.1 million people misused them for the first time. There were over 33,000 deaths from overdosing on opioids, and over 15,000 of those deaths were attributed to commonly prescribed opioids. Unfortunately, this trend is just increasing. More and more people are becoming addicted and are dying from opioid drug use. For opioid prescriptions, 21 to 29 percent of patients prescribed opioids for chronic pain misuse them. 8 to 12 percent develop an opioid use disorder and an estimated 4 to 6 percent who misuse prescription opioids transition to heroin. 80 percent of people who use heroin first misuse prescription opioids. If we can stop the misuse of prescription opioids, perhaps we can, misuse, we can reduce the number of people becoming addicted to these pills and also prevent people from transitioning to other illegal substances such as heroin. How people are abusing these prescription opioids um, really just depends on their personal preference. There's oral abuse where people will take multiple pills or they might chew or crush a product to try to defeat the extended release properties of the opioid itself. There's encephalation where people crush a pill or a capsule into tiny particles and snort them in their nose. There's also injection and smoking abuse for these products. Now we're going to talk about abuse deterrent testing. So current, there are products on the market right now that contain abuse deterrent properties. And the most common one is physiochemical prop abuse deterrent properties. This is where products will add excipients that will make them diff difficult to crush or chew. They also may add excipients that will gel in the presence of liquids so that they cannot be injected. There's also um, an opioid antagonist abuse deterrent properties where if the product is taking it, taken as intended, it will provide ther therapeutic release, relief. However, if it is misused in any way, an antagonist will be released and that will prevent the user from feeling the high from the opioid itself. There are other types of abuse deterrent properties that are in development right now with companies. They include de abuse deterrent delivery systems, prodrugs, and other new technologies. The FDA has published guidance on how to determine if a product is abuse deterrent or not. This was published in April 2015. The FDA also has published a general principles for generic drug products, and this guidance was finalized in November of 17, so just last month. 
The FDA breaks abuse deterrent testing into four different categories. Category one involves the in vitro laboratory testing to determine, um, to determine if the product is able to be abuse deterrent for crushing or extraction. Category two is where humans are ingest the product or take the product as intended or they manipulate the product and take that and you get a PK profile of how the drug is released in the body. Category three is the abuse liability studies where recreational drug users will take the drug through unintentional routes of abuse and rate if they like the high that they get or if they will take the drug again. Category four is post-surveillance marketing studies that come after a drug product has been approved and it is on the market. All of these studies, categories one through three, involve comparators. So the drug product that is being tested for abuse deterrent is compared to something that does not have abuse deterrent properties or even it's compared to other products that are currently on the market that have abuse deterrent properties. Moving into category one abuse deterrent testing further. Category one testing, one of the first studies that we perform are physical manipulation studies. This is using common household tools to look at the ability to crush, grate, or grind the product. The results that we generate from this include manipulation time, how long it takes to actually crush the product or grate it. We look at the ease of manipulation. We look at recovery where the intact capsule or tablet is weighed and then the manipulation is performed on it and we collect what we can and see how much of the product was actually manipulated and able to be recovered. We perform particle size studies, and this is especially important for products that are intended to be abuse deterrent for encephalation. And we also look at the effect of thermal treatment, such as heating and freezing, on how, it, how you can manipulate a product. There's large volume extractions. That's also a very big part of category one testing. So the drug products are placed in various chemical solvents. There's typically solvents that you can find at the grocery store, hardware stores, and you look at the amount of opioid released over time. So the testing that's required for large volume extraction is you look at the separation of an antagonist from the op opioid, if that is the abuse deterrent property that you're exploring. You look at the effect of release of intact products versus manipulated products. And you also gather a lot of data concerning the concentration of opioid in solution versus time, temperature, pH, and agitation. Other studies that are performed for category one testing include vaporization studies. So you look and see if the product can be smoked. And then also pH precipitation studies, which is commonly known as freebasing, if the product is in a salt form. Last but not least, syringability studies are very important part of category one testing. In syringability studies, small volumes of solvents are used to look at how much drug can be extracted from the tablet or capsule. The ability to draw and expel from a syringe is explored. And what makes syringability studies unique from other category one testing is that these cannot be evaluated in category two or three studies. A lot of times the excipients within these new products are, um, are toxic or their toxicity is unknown if it was to be injected in a human. So therefore it is not a safe way of testing and the FDA primarily relies on syringeability category one testing to evaluate if the product is abuse deterrent for injection or not. Now we're going to move into a case study of Aponit. It's been a hot topic lately in the abuse deterrent realm. Aponit ER is an extended release version of oxymorphone hydrochloride. It was approved in 2006 by the FDA for management of moderate to zero severe pain around the clock. And unfortunately, when it was approved in 2006, 
It was being abused by many people. It was being crushed and snorted, and people were using it to get high. So because of this, Opana ER was reformulated in 2010 with physiochemical properties that were intended to be resistant to intranasal and intravenous routes of abuse. However, even though they reformulated in 2010, in June of 2017, the FDA requested that Opana be removed from the market. So let's look at what happened that led the FDA to want to remove Opana from the market. So starting in New York State in 2011, there was a hepatitis C virus outbreak. And this virus outbreak was linked to prescription opioids. The largest percentage of opioids used include Opana and OxyContin. Then again, in Tennessee in 2012, there was an outbreak of TTP, which is related to some of the excipients found in these extended release products. This outbreak was directly linked to the injection of Opana ER, and this allowed this prompted the FDA and the CDC to issue a warning. However, at this point, they still did not want to remove the product from the market without further data. Unfortunately, they got some more data. In Scott County in Indiana in 2015, there was a huge outbreak of HIV cases. The CDC interviewed all the residents who had injected drugs in the past 12 months and most of the participants had injected Opana ER. Unfortunately, the way that Opana ER and the oxymorphone is, this is what has caused these outbreaks. The price of these products are very steep. So a lot of times the drug users will share a tablet between two to four people because they don't have enough money to buy their own. Because this is also a very strong opioid, it, well, it only takes a little bit of injection in order to get the people high. However, the high definitely um, diminishes faster, and they have to make multiple injections per day to prevent withdrawal. A lot of the people interviewed stated that they moved from encephalation of the Pana ER to injection when it was reformulated to become crush resistant. Now, all of these cases that we just reviewed is what contribute, contributed to the recommendation of taking this product off the market. And um, I don't know about everybody else, but this always makes me ask, how do we prevent this from happening again? And the answer to that is through syringability studies. So per the FDA in the 2015 guidance, the amount of opioid that can be obtained in a syringe should be based on studies where you look at the intact and manipulated product and their comparators using small volumes of water, room temperature, high temperature, with and without agitation. They also, from the 2017 generic guidance, they recommend volumes of 10 milliliters and the extraction time should range between five and 60 minutes. And they've also recommended that the needle gauge be 21 gauge or finer. So when performing syringeability studies in the laboratory, we look at one sample per time point evaluated. And this is because of the large amount of data that is needed for each individual sample. For samples intended to defer intravenous abuse, we always start with the largest needle size, which is 21 gauge. If the 21 gauge needle is efficient, then we are able to move to smaller gauges. However, hopefully, if it's intended to deter abuse, the 21 gauge needle will not be able to draw the solution into a syringe. These are very large studies and they generate a lot of data. For example, for each formulation tested, you're gonna look at your product both intact and manipulated, at room temperature and at high temperature, with and without agitation, there'll be multiple time points, many different solvent volumes, and triplicate replicates are always recommended, and this helps reduce variability in the testing. And we also look at real life filters. So instead of using laboratory filters, we look at cotton Q-tip filters or cigarette filters 
as drug abusers tend to be able to have access to these instead of typical syringe filters that are found in laboratories. For this one situation, that's 480 samples. And this isn't even including any of the comparators that are going to be tested. So when I said that they're large studies, they're very large studies. When we measure syringeability in the laboratory, we look to see if the solution can be expelled from the syringe. We look at the viscosity of the liquid that's able to be drawn into the syringe. We calculate syringe volume. We always take representative photographs because, as everyone knows, a picture speaks a thousand words. And we also look at the concentration of API in solution, the milligrams of opioid present in the syringe, and that translates to a percent label claim in the syringe. And all of this data is obtained through HPLC analysis in our laboratories. So looking at syringeability study design, one of the first things we look at is choosing a sample container. We don't just grab a glass off the shelf. We do carefully look at the containers that need to be used for these studies because they may make a difference. So for each, when we get a product, we will look at how it behaves in different size jars. So this is an example of a jar study that was performed for a product. And we looked at different diameters ranging from small to large. And as you can see from the graph, that the largest diameter jar actually resulted in the most release of API over the course of time in a small volume extraction study. Therefore, the large size jar will be chosen for future experiments because it represents a worst case scenario. You always want to try to test a product to failure. So we want to put this in a a container that is going to give us the worst results we can possibly get. Because if you can test your product and show that you're better than the comparators under these bad situations, like the worst situations for your product, then you have a compelling story to tell the FDA. Now, an example of another study that was performed, we looked at a couple different size jars and as you can see from here, it, the size of the jar didn't make a difference in the uh, release of API. So therefore, it was concluded in this study that the sample container wasn't a critical parameter for the studies being performed. Another critical parameter is how you handle the sample. In sample one, the analyst manipulated the product and transferred to it to the jar without any further treatment. However, for sample two, the analyst manipulated the product, transferred it to a jar, and then took their time to carefully spread it across the bottom of the jar so that it could be in constant contact with the extraction solvent. And we looked at the release of API over the course of time based on how the samples were and the way that sample two was handled definitely increased the amount of API that was dissolved in some of the time points, and therefore that represents the worst case scenario for this product. And it was written into the protocol that the sample should be evenly spread across the bottom of the jar prior to any studies being done. I mentioned agitation as one of the parameters also. So there's a couple different types of agitation that we can use in the laboratory. The first is a picture of a wrist action shaker. We also have orbital shaking and there's a bonus with the orbital shaker is that you can um, have them within an incubator so that you can also control the temperature for those higher agitation requirements, higher temperature agitation requirements that the FDA would like to see. And then also we can place stir bars within sample containers and stir them on stir plates as a type of agitation. So just like any other study design, we looked at the amount of opioid released over the course of time with these different stirring. And the orbital shaking showed the highest amount of release over the course of time. And therefore, orbital shaking was recommended for this product to move forward in syringeability studies. So now that we have everything, all of the 
the variables worked out on what we're going to do for the testing. Now it's time to actually perform the syringeability studies. So we have our sample in its container. We will add a predetermined amount of water for injection or another solvent that's being studied. And we let it sit for a period of time, either with or without agitation. After that is when we typically take our pictures. You can see how the sample has dissolved within the solvent. That's always a good thing for the analyst to note. Another thing to point out here is that everything is labeled. The corresponding syringes that go with the sample are labeled, and this just helps prevent any confusion in the samples and allows us to track our samples well. So when we use our syringe, we'll take the tear rate of the syringe. We'll syringe our solution using the cotton Q-tip filter in this case. And then we obtain our gross weight of the syringe plus the sample. Using the density of the extraction liquid that was performed in the syringeability test, we we're able to calculate the exact volume of solution that was syringed. And because these are typically very concentrated samples, they have to be further diluted before they're placed on the HPLC for analysis. I mentioned that we use one sample per time point, and this is because we'll perform dilutions on some portions of the sample, and then we'll also get viscosity readings or other types of analysis on the remaining part of the sample. Other syringeability studies that should be considered for Category 1 abuse deterrent testing includes um, the CRISPIN procedure. So CRISPIN is a direct, um, it's directly influenced from the reformulation of opioid dr drug products. And most of these drug products that were reformulated, they added excipients that formed a gel to prevent them from being able to be injected. Of course, the drug abusers did not like this very much, so they tried and came up with a way called CRISPIN to still inject the drug product. And in this, the drug abusers will brown a manipulated formulation with heat. They either cook it in an oven, use a microwave, or even use a handheld lighter. There are well-documented procedures of the CRISPIN procedure on drug abuse websites um, for other abusers to follow. Therefore, we need to explore this in the laboratory to make sure that any future products can be resistant to this type of cooking. So when we perform a laboratory simulation of CRISPIN, we look at two different types of heat sources, either a microwave or a muffle furnace, which will simulate a common household oven. And we look at how long it takes to heat the product in order to get the brown procedure and allow it to be syringable. So we have to look at the heat time study. We look at the assay and degradant considerations in that. We want to make sure that when we cook these samples, we're not just destroying the drug product itself, um, and therefore that's why it's not being successful. We look at the course of time and the amount of degradants formed and the mass balance and assay. So as you can see here in the microwave, we looked at the 45 second time point all the way up to three minutes of heating time and monitored the assay and the degradants to determine the ample time, the correct time to crisp the drug product. We also did the same thing in an oven and looked at the chromatography to see the degradants forming and to see if that assay was still in an acceptable range for the heating. Another important part of the CRISPIN procedure is variability. So, all of these jars shown here were heated in the microwave for the same amount of time. And there's a wide variety of uh, crisping or the brown color that you can see. So it's really important to try to reduce variability in heating. And how we do that in our laboratory is we heat our samples off center, but we also mark a certain area in the microwave where the sample is always put. 
if we put the samples in the same exact spot every single time and cook them all for the same time, then we get a nice even heating that has less variability. It's also important that the microwave will heat up over time. So it's important to allow the microwave to cool between heating so that you don't overcook your samples. So here's an example of using the microwave placement. So before heating, the samples are a white powder. And then after heating, they all turned into a light brown to brown crisp powder using this microwave technique. If the muffle furnace is used, it's important to make sure that the muffle furnace returns to temperature after opening and closing the door several times because it can lose heat very quickly. And it's important to monitor the temperature prior to putting the next set of samples in the oven. Another study that can be performed is the gel blob study. In this, in real life, an abuser would manipulate a product by adding a small amount of liquid to it. They will keep adding liquid until the formulation no longer takes in the liquid anymore. So then the additional liquid that's surrounding the formulation has drug product in it and it can be syringable. So this should also be looked at within a laboratory setting to see if it can resist this gel blob study. Other experiments that may be required by the FDA include using different extraction solvents, such as ethanol, and extraction, different extraction volumes. All of these are based on each individual formulation and how it behaves and should be discussed carefully with the FDA once some preliminary data is available. Another important thing that is starting to be looked at due to the Opana cases is the characterization of excipients in the syringable solution. If there are novel excipients within the formulation, then we'll need to know if, if people choose to misuse the product and inject it, it will be the FDA wants to learn what kind of harm they can expect to see or if it will harm them in the first place. So looking at the amount of excipients in syringable solutions is also important along with the amount of drug product. Um, again, I can't say this enough, you want to test to failure. If you don't test to failure, you're not challenging your product. And drug abusers are very smart. They're going to try their best to defeat these abuse deterrent properties. So we need to be smarter than them and go ahead and anticipate what they're going to do so that we can make sure that the drug products will not be susceptible to other forms of abuse. In conclusion, the requirements in the study design of your formulation will change based on what formulation you have. The syringability category one results must be accurate and reliable. Design and execution of your study is critical to success, but most importantly, we need to remember that these products can save lives. If we can prevent somebody from misusing an opioid drug that they were prescribed, then perhaps we can prevent people from transitioning to heroin or becoming dependent on these products for the rest of their life. Great, thank you, Angela. And now we'd like to begin the question and answer portion of today's presentation. It looks like we've had a few come through during the presentation, but please feel free to continue to type your questions in as we go along here. The first question is, what are the major trends in regulation around opioids? So the major trends that we've been seeing and the regulation is moving not only for the in vitro category one testing, but also requiring those category two and three hazard abuse liability studies. You can only predict so much to happen in the laboratory. However, when these products get into humans and especially recreational drug abusers, you can really tell if they are resisting abuse or not through their um, blood test and through the drug liking and if they would take the drug again. Okay. Um, how is the size slash density of a cotton ball controlled? 
Well, a lot of times we just buy one of those 750 pack of cotton Q-tips and when you pull the cotton off and roll it between your fingers, you typically get a pretty consistent ball that's used. Um, I didn't really, I haven't really noticed a big difference in um, all of the cotton balls that I've prepared over my course of time. How do you quantify the amount of polymeric excipients in solution? So I think for that, that would probably be used by LCMS. And uh, unfortunately, Alchemy does not have those capabilities, so we don't do that here. For how long do you attempt aspiration through the needle into the syringe? So we will pull the syringe and we will hold it for a predetermined amount of time that's specified in the protocol. So typically um, two to three minutes, we'll start a timer and we'll, uh, we'll pull up on the syringe plunger and whatever will come into the syringe is what we test over the course of two minutes. Anything after that is pretty much not going to draw into solution. What are the major hurdles in getting a drug approved by the FDA? I think one of the major, one of the most major hurdles for abuse deterrent products is just all of the testing that's required. Not only do you have to characterize your product and go through the typical CMC and stability requirements that are needed, but you also have to go through all of these category one, two, and three studies, which take a long time. Category one studies have to be performed first because they characterize the manipulation of the drug product and then that manipulation and how the drug is treated is translated into the human studies of category two and three. And um, the recruitment of people during the category two and three studies takes a little bit of time and then also performing these studies are very costly and time intensive. So definitely the um, category testings that are required is what is the biggest hurdle of getting through. And then um, don't forget that as soon as you get through all of this and the FDA is ready to think about approving your product, you also have to go through an advisory committee meeting with the advisory committee, which is also um, something that you have to have a lot of preparation for and can take a lot of time. How long does it typically take to execute a full syringeability study? It's totally dependent on the product and the scope of the study, but in the past, it's taken us a couple months with a team of experts. What is your experience with characterization of excipients slash excipient degradants analytics? Um, Alchemy doesn't have the resources to do the excipient characterization studies, so we aren't doing that at this point, so I don't have very much experience in that. What are the major hurdles in syringability design, and how does Alchemy overcome these? I think the biggest hurdles in syringability design is just all of the variables that go into it, the sample container, the heating time, the agitation, the amount of sample, how to transfer the sample that from the manipulated state into the jar itself. And all of this is overcome through careful study evaluations and small executed evaluations. Once we evaluate the different types of variables, then we can use it to go through the study, and um, it pretty much runs seamlessly after that. What is the best way to present? Sorry, what is the best way to present the large amount of data to an, an adcom? Well, I think previous adcoms have shown us how not to present the data, and um, I think the biggest thing is to keep the graph simple. Um, 
definitely graphs, comparison graphs help, but they need to be easily understood. It's important to realize that some of these people in the ADCOM uh, aren't scientists. So if you can show it, if you can um, keep it simple and just show how much better the product is, I think that's the best way to do it. But definitely it takes a lot of practice and consulting before you're ready for the ADCOM with this data. How to compare products that are using different ADS technologies in these studies. Example, swelling versus antagonistic. Okay. So I think in that case, you need to choose the right comparator. You wouldn't want to compare something that has a physiochemical abuse deterrent property to something that uses an opioid antagonist. There's other choices and other products on the market that can be chosen for comparison in those cases. Great. These have all been great questions. We'll give a, another minute or so to see if any more come in. All right. Well, thank you all for your great questions. And if you think of any more, please feel free to send an email to um, to Angela. Her email address is right up on there on your screen, angela.more at alchemynow.com. Also, as I mentioned at the beginning of this webinar, um, it has been recorded, and you will receive a follow-up email in the next few days with a link to the recording as well as a copy of the slide. So with that, we say thank you very much for taking the time to join us today, and we hope that you have a great rest of your day.